Uh, Andrew Smith is a professor of history of Christianity in the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. He teaches courses in New Testament, history of Christianity, Christian doctrine, and religious studies. And he's also the pastor of Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church in Talbot, Tennessee. He's married to Pam Smith, who teaches in Carson Newman's nursing department. And he has two great kids, Elizabeth and Charlotte. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Andrew Smith. Thanks, Noah. Uh, oh, I was about to ask if this thing is on, but you know what? It is on. This thing is absolutely on. I want to, I want to talk to you this morning. More people are coming in. Y'all come in. I want to talk to you about uh, this morning about something that's really important to me, and that is why it is really important to learn to talk about things that are hard to talk about and why it's important to learn to talk about things where there's differences of opinion. Is anyone in here a member of one of my two New Testament classes? Wave at me if you're a member. There you are. There's a few. I know I have like two classes of 26, so y'all are supposed to be here. You're fresh persons, right? Uh, you've heard me talk about this a little bit. Uh, I can't get you to peep in class. I can't get you to speak, and I think it's because you've, you've all been cowed by a culture that says, if you say the wrong thing, we're going to squash you. We're all really embarrassed by ideas, so if I speak out, I'll get squashed. I don't want to get squashed, so I'm going to keep my head down, right? Uh, but under those conditions, uh, the body politic democracy cannot flourish in an environment where people feel like they can't speak out because their opinion is unpopular. Uh, that's not a good thing, so I want to talk about that just a little bit this morning in a, uh, hesitate to call this a uh, lecture, uh, just a little talk uh, called Dare to Persuade. I'm not ready to be off book this morning. I'm going to do the best I can to speak to you very directly, especially those of you whose eyeballs I have on the front row, right? You're paying so much attention, I'm terrified, right? I have never, I, it's been so like, I don't get that often on Sunday morning, right? I preach on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. I'm old school, coat and tie, 11 o'clock, Sunday morning, it's time to go, and I don't get a lot of eyeballs like that, Okay. Look, I want to start by telling you a story of when I was a student at Carson Newman all these years ago. It is fall of 2023, which means I started here in the fall 25 years ago. I am getting really old. Uh, sometimes I go back to my office and I think, boy, my students didn't seem to be very tuned in this morning. Well, it was 8 and 9 o'clock in the morning. Of, you know, they, of course they weren't tuned in. They were tired. Uh, and then I think back to things that I experienced when I was a first-year student at Carson Newman. And I think, you know what? All of those memories are really vague. What was I doing my first year at Carson Newman, right? In other words, if they're kind of drifting through their classes and they're kind of trying to get things done and they're there most of the time, they're doing exactly what I did when I was a first year student at Carson Newman. So maybe I should take my foot off the gas of the criticism by my students a little bit. But I do have this one memory. I was here at Carson Newman. I was a student. And a colleague of Martin Luther King's during the Civil Rights Movement joined us for dinner, and he spoke about some of the things that he experienced during the Civil Rights Movement. And I wish I could remember who he was. I can't remember. That's how much attention I was paying when I was a Carson Newman student. I was an undergraduate. Some of it's a little fuzzy, but I do remember this story as clear as a bell. We were preparing for a march, and then Dr. King ran down the stairs into the basement, and he said, the cameras are here. We've got to go, because King knew that a civil rights demonstration was not actually for the local people, it was for the evening news. And at the, at the time, I thought, that's a pretty weird story. I said, isn't there something dishonest, isn't that kind of, kind of shady, kind of sus, as it were, uh, about performing for a television camera? To perform for a television camera. Now, I never see photographs like this that I don't think back to that story. It is framed the way that I've understood the entire civil rights movement. This image, and so many like it, are meant to be seen on the front page of newspapers, in newsreels, that was still a thing during the Civil Rights Movement, and on television. You might even say that these events were crafted to persuade. The idea was not just to express an opinion, but to move other people's opinions so the goals of the Civil Rights Movement could be achieved. And after all, this is the person, Martin Luther King, who said, quote, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend, unquote. That is persuasion. In one of his last sermons, The Drum Major Instinct, King tells a story of talking to his jailers and his wardens while he was in jail. Quote, I always try to do a little converting when I'm in jail. 
And when we were in jail in Birmingham the other day, the white wardens all uh, enjoyed coming around to the cell to talk about the race problem. And they were showing us where we were so wrong demonstrating, and they were showing us where segregation was so right, and they were showing us where intermarriage was so wrong. So I would get to preaching, and we'd get to talking calmly because they wanted to talk about it, unquote. Can you imagine having a calm conversation about this in these circumstances? You're in jail. Your captors want to have a conversation with you. That's what courage looks like. But I want to talk more about that in a minute. Quote, and then we got to talk about where they lived and how much they were earning. And when these brothers told me what they were earning, I said, you know what? You ought to be marching with us. You're just as poor as Negroes. And I said, you are put in the position of supporting your oppressor because through prejudice and blindness, you fail to see that the same forces that oppress Negroes in American society oppress poor white people. You ought to be out here marching with us every time we have a march, unquote. Is there anything more courageous than to look an enemy in the eye and see not someone to be destroyed, but someone to be changed into a friend? Fast forward, 2023, look at this. I love memes. I would love to spend 15 or 20 minutes cycling through a lot of memes. They make me laugh. My daughter has an email address in the school, uh, at her school, and sometimes I email her memes during the day. Uh, this one's a little bit more sober. This meme is not, in some ways, that far from the thought world that King encountered in his jailers, and it's easy for religious people like me to forget how much religious language was used to justify racial segregation. But the rhetoric here is different. This does not imagine the enemy as a potential friend. Let me ask y'all a question. Okay, I'm gonna ask y'all a question first. Raise your hand if you got less than six hours of sleep last night. Okay, less than six, oh, that's plenty of them, right? They fessed up, right? Less than six hours of sleep. Uh, there you go. Yes, sir. Now, let me, let me ask you this. You know, I always tell my students in the MDiv program that if you are a pastor, if you're not a culture critic, you're not anything, right? So every morning I like to eat yogurt for breakfast because it has active cultures and I wanna be a student of culture. Does anyone here, did anyone here have any yogurt for breakfast? Anyone, oh, yogurt, one of you, right? I love that stuff. This morning it was faye with the raspberry that you put in it and that, that's the best. I can never bring myself to spend the money. Got one more question for you. Raise your hand if you're a bigot. I can't get anyone to fess up. Let me, let me tell you something. Uh, I can't get a single person to raise their hand how many bigots. Nobody wants to be called a bigot. Nobody wants to self-identify as a bigot. And if I called you out and said, you're a bigot, you'd probably get mad. Maybe that's happened to you. You wouldn't want to talk to me anymore. I looked at this image a good long while, and I came to some conclusions about it. First, it's not going to change anybody's mind. After all, for someone who disagrees with this statement to come around to agreeing with it, they have to say, well, I used to be a bigot, but now I'm not anymore. Nobody wants to be a bigot, but also nobody wants to used to be a bigot. Nobody wants that. Nobody's going to fess up to that. No one can bear the burden of 180 degree change. I'm not sure we're capable of it. We're like battleships. It takes a long time to turn us around. This is a long way from King saying to his jailers, you know, in every way that really matters, we're already a lot alike. Two. It makes people who agree with it feel good for believing what they already believe, and it creates community around people who already agree with it. And finally, these two twin responses of pushing them away while pulling us together ends up building rival tribes, people who only express their thoughts to each other, to people that are just like them. So instead of attempts at persuasion between people who don't agree, you get in-group tribalism and suspicion between groups. My guess is that some of this sounds kind of familiar to you. It's not original to me, but my question this morning is why? This is the question. What has changed in our world, in the United States and the rest of the West, to bring about this failure of persuasion as an ideal in favor of in-group solidarity? I want you to bear with me this morning as I introduce you to the work of Charles Taylor. Taylor's a Canadian Christian philosopher who's done groundbreaking work in trying to understand why human beings understand themselves the way that they do. There are a million things I'd love to tell you about his work, but I'm gonna focus on just one or two this morning. Taylor says that throughout most of human history, people did things the way they did because they had always done them that way. People obeyed the king because they'd already always obeyed the king. That's what traditional politics looks like. 
And everything else they did, they did that way, whether planting or plowing or trading or raising their kids, everything they did, they did the same way their parents did it. Every generation, nothing changes. That was the way God was assumed to have put things together, and everybody did it as a group. In medieval villages in England, they would do this thing called beating the bounds, where everybody had to come out once a year, and everybody from the bishop and the squire all the way down to the lowest of the low, and they would beat the earth around the village to keep the evil spirits out. But it only works if everybody in the village comes out to do it. The group came first, The individual came last, not because the king is a person who gets to tell people what to do, but because we've always done it that way. That is the way that medieval Europe was put together, according to Taylor. Then the Enlightenment happens. And especially with the French Revolution and the American Revolution, uh, the fruit of the Enlightenment, this this ancient way of doing things starts to change. In France, uh, some of you know the story of the French Revolution, and elsewhere later in Europe, people are finally able to question the divine mandate behind the authority of king and the church and all the other institutions below those. So people are no longer going to participate in church or politics or anything else just because it had always been done that way. Instead, they have to come up with new structures that recruit people into voluntary participation. And those new institutions are going to be institutions, political, economic, religious, uh, that you have to be persuaded, pushed, dragooned, or bullied into. That's what Taylor says. And he calls this the age of mobilization. Traditional institutions fail. So people are bullied and pulled into creating new voluntary organizations. They kind of get voluntold. Okay, At its worst, the age of mobilization was a time when states and churches pushed and bullied people into doing what during the Middle Ages they had always done automatically. But at its best, the age of mobilization was a time when people were able to come together to build structures of politics and religion that really belonged to them, that they chose, and that they believed in. This very institution, Carson Newman University, is the product of a denomination, the Baptists, the quintessential product of the age of mobilization, which was created by people who insisted on expressing their faith through churches and institutions like this one that were voluntary and that were built from the ground up. In fact, Taylor says that the United States is special because it is a place where we were built from the ground up as a nation in the age of mobilization. There is no ancient traditional layer underneath our systems of religion and our systems of politics. But the thing about this, the age of mobilization, and I'm way oversimplifying here, is that its emphasis on getting people to voluntarily accomplish ends leaked into people's thinking and it caused them to think more and more in terms of rights that people must have if it's right that they be voluntarily gathered to build the structures of society. It's about the value of the individual. And this, along with doubts about the Christian faith that creep in because of questions of the Enlightenment, questions that we have to take really seriously at an institution like this, tends by 1960 to push us into a new period of history that Taylor calls the Age of Authenticity. You don't know it yet, but everyone in this room has been deeply, deeply influenced by the Age of Authenticity way more than you realize. During the age of authenticity, we back away from this need, this felt need to build institutions for ourselves. And that gives way to a new core value. Each of us has to find out who we really are inside and how we, after we figure that out, we have to express it and be true to it. And by now, 2023 in the West, almost everyone agrees that this is life's central moral mandate. Turn on the Disney Channel for 15 minutes. Someone will tell you to be true to yourself and to be who you really are. That is the central moral mandate of our time. The opposite of this is to conform to some external standard, whether that be a religious standard, a moral standard, a political standard, what have you. It doesn't matter. Conformity now to any kind of external expectation is heresy. We are products of the age of authenticity. Here's an example from a book, A Light in the Heart, by Roy T. Bennett. I'm going to read this in its entirety because he does such a good job of summing it up. Don't let the expectations and opinions of others affect your decisions. It's your life, not theirs. Do what matters most to you. Do what makes you feel alive and happy. Don't let the expectations and ideas of others limit who you are. 
If you let others tell who you are, you're living their reality, not yours. There's more to life than pleasing people. There's much more to life than following others' prescribed path. There's so much more to life than what you experience right now. You need to decide who you are for yourself. Become a whole being. Adventure. I'm not trying to pick on the author. I chose this quotation because he sums up these important themes of the age of authenticity. First, don't let anyone else's ideas define you. Only you can decide what's right for you. Two, you can get away with this because apparently everyone has their own reality. I don't even have time this morning to talk about how the very idea of a university or a church or morality become meaningless in a world in which reality is assumed to be subjective and chosen. I can't touch it. There's no time. Third, the alternative to conformity is adventure. Meeting your responsibilities is really boring. So go on an adventure instead. I don't, I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to stick to the script. Now, I could say to you, do you think this is true? Is this the most important thing in life, to live out your inner truth? How can you know that it's true? Now, in my opinion, here's the crux of the matter. Are you big enough and deep enough to orient the meaning of your own existence? Y'all are college fresh persons. That means that 20 years ago, most of you didn't exist. And in 80 years, almost everyone in this room will be dead. Is there any way for you to find meaning in your own individual existence? You're limited. You're finite. There was a time when you weren't here, and eventually you're going to die. Now, that's not why I bring all this up but I want you to stick with me. When Taylor discusses the age of authenticity, he goes on to talk about the world of fashion, clothes, makeup, fashion. I'm not making this up. Most of us live our best life. Is anyone here living their best life? Anyone at all? Noah Soltau is living his best life. I am so excited for you, I am. A lot of us live our best lives by purchasing and displaying things. Do we do this as a way of expressing who we want to be and who we want other people to think we are in the hopes that they'll see it and acknowledge it? The age of authenticity is a time when we're all trying to figure out who we truly are inside without reference to any external authority, but then we're reduced to putting that on display and waiting for someone else to acknowledge us. And without someone else's acknowledgement, our self-expression has missed its mark. So we're caught in this paradox of a need to be who we really are, but we're not really who we are until we get affirmation from others. And to make that worse, we do it by buying stuff and putting it on display. We put it on our bodies, we put it on our cars, we put it in our yards, everywhere. Look at my tattoo, look at my bumper sticker. I ran a 5K, let's go Brandon. Everyone's got a bumper sticker on their car. Look at me, look at me, affirm me. I am expressing myself. These are not ideas available for debate. These are now displays and they seek affirmation. I want to give you an example from one of my very favorite books, which is not Charles Taylor's A Secular Age. I love it, but this one's better, okay? Go, Dog, Go by P.D. Eastman. I love it. My kids loved it. I love it. Our copy is falling apart. I meant to bring it with me. I left it in my office upstairs. It was published in 1961. The Age of Authenticity begins about 1960. This book was published in 1961, and as I read it again, I came to realize, wait a minute, this is a primer on the age of authenticity. This is a preschooler's guide to how to behave in this strange new world we find ourselves in. Now, key to the plot, if you can call it a plot, are repeated interaction between these two dogs. The first dog is always seeking affirmation for her fashion choices, and she says, do you like my hat? And the other dog offers the same answer every time, I do not. And that exchange leads to the same outcome every time, goodbye. The refusal of affirmation leads to a parting of the ways. Style is never a matter of debate or conversation. There's no right or wrong about it. So they just walk away. There's no accounting for taste. It's below rationality. There's no chance for connection beyond difference, only alienation. Now, towards the end of the book, we see this. Okay, a big dog party. There's a cake being distributed up there with candles. Apparently, this is a birthday party. And the thing about birthdays is they're not civil celebrations. They're not religious celebrations. They're celebrations of the self, not even the accomplishments of the self. They're just celebrations of our mere continued existence. Congratulations, you survived another year. 
And at this birthday party, the dogs are of every color and size. They're very, they're very diverse. They're all doing their own thing. And on the next page, one more time, the bright red poodle asks the same question, do you like my hat? But the hat is crazy. Look at the hat. It's full of all kinds of stuff, party stuff. It's kind of a celebration of diversity. And the dog finally says, I like that party hat. In other words, the dog finally gets the affirmation she wants by switching to a hat that in turn offers affirmation of the big dog party and everything that it represents. Diversity of nature, diversity of action. Celebration of the self for the sake of the self. Fashion is offered to us as a way of expressing who we really are, but in the end, just like this poor ketchup-colored poodle, we end up wearing the hat other people want us to wear because the costs of refusal are too high because the cost is alienation. Back to this. Earlier, I mentioned that this image pushes away people who don't agree and creates in-group bonds among those who do. In other words, if Taylor is right about how fashion is a key way we interact with each other during the age of authenticity, then our political and religious opinions are no longer things that we submit to others for consideration and debate. They are articles of fashion. You cannot debate style. There's no accounting for taste. You either like my hat or you don't. Our opinions in politics, religion, economics are part of our true inward identity, and they become matters of taste. We seek affirmation of them from those who agree. We try to steer clear from those who don't. Social media has made it really easy to treat matters of deadly importance, like matters of fashion, because we can throw up a meme like this, and that turns an idea into an object of display, and therefore affirmation or rejection more than discussion and debate. Under these circumstances, the best we can hope for when someone says, I don't like your hat, is that we simply say goodbye. That's the best you can hope for. But sometimes it's a lot worse. If the central mandate of our time is that you should find out who you really are inside and then live this out, then the great moral failures of our time are to conform to external authority and to seek to influence or coerce other people into failing to live out their own true identities. If someone expresses an opinion that's perceived to be either of those things, that person is now an enemy. In the example above, that person is a bigot. And because that person has transgressed the central taboo of our time, they have to be silenced and defeated. You might shame them into silence. You might vote them out of legal existence. You might find a way to illegalize the things that they say. Anything, anything but dialogue. Because leaving yourself open to being persuaded is admitting that there's something out there other than your true self that may have some say over how you live your life. We don't seek to persuade anymore. That's what Martin Luther King was trying to do, to persuade, to engage. We don't do that anymore. All we do is express ourselves because we don't think anyone's opinion matters to us but our own. And the political mess that we're in is a direct result of that. Here's what I'm trying to say. We live in a world in which we've been given the promise of authenticity. Having been freed from the control of illegitimate religious and cultural influences, we're finally free to go on a journey of self-discovery, or so the story goes. But what this journey seems to be bringing us is runaway consumerism, political polarization, intellectual stagnation, and it seems to me a very real threat of social disorder that be, may be unlike anything ever seen by anyone now living. Let me be clear. One thing, uh, Taylor defends the age of authenticity. He says, you know what? The age of authenticity has ushered in a world in which so many forms of discrimination have been melted away, in which cult cultural forms that have trapped people in all kinds of inequities have lost their power. I agree with him. I don't want to go back. But that's no reason to deny that it has brought its own terrible problems. We are not living in a utopia. And doubling down on authenticity will not bring about a utopia. I'm a Christian. Many of y'all are followers of Christ too. This university is built on the promise that we can best understand the world and in particular human nature, our origin, our purpose, and our destiny when we read those things through the lenses of what the Christian faith says about them. So it's appropriate for me to stand on this stage and ask, what resources does the Christian faith offer to help us back away from this precipice? For starters, like I said, I don't think it has to mean we have to back away from the age of authenticity altogether. It's not going to go away. And as I said, much of what it has brought us is good. 
But if I'm right about its danger, the the age of authenticity has ushered in an age of rage in which, at best, we stick to our little tribes where everyone thinks like us, and at worst, when we engage those who are unlike us, we engage them as hated enemies to be destroyed or quarantined or silenced. We have to address this. And I look to my faith to help me know how. Christianity emerged in a world in which the Greeks imagined a God who was so great that God never thought about anything but God. But the Jewish people told a different story about a God who made the world, who sought to be engaged with the world, but whose most important inhabitants, us, kept turning away. God wanted a relationship with us, and we kept turning to our own devices and away from God. In Genesis, the origin story of our own world isn't even over before Adam and Eve take the fruit from the serpent because the serpent says, you'll be like God. Why let God lord it over you? Take the fruit, be your own God, be the center of your own world. But when they take the fruit, they end up cast from the garden and wearing animal skins. God spends the rest of the Old Testament trying to restore contact with the world, not by yelling at people from a cloud and giving advice, but by calling one person, Abraham, and promising to make him a great nation. And that nation will be God's own people. They get God's law, and the purpose of that is not to turn them into divine house pets, but to send them on a mission to make them God's way of reestablishing contact with the world, God's way of being heard again in a world that is turned inward to its own devices. Through Israel, God sought to speak to the world, I am here, come back, let us reason together. To be a Christian is to confess that God's plan was and remains to bring the world back into a right relationship with God through Israel. And the full flowering of that plan was the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In him, we see not only that God is always, ever without fail, trying to re-engage the world, trying to re-establish a relationship with us, but that God does this without coercion, without arm twisting, without threats. If we claim to belong to him, we can only do the same thing. We shouldn't be surprised that a world in which we're trained to turn inward to find a moral compass and a sense of what's valuable and right is also a world in which people turn away from and maybe against others that are a threat to what they find there. I will repeat that. You cannot turn inward without turning away from and against. That is why the age of authenticity is also the age of rage. We are called to a better way. If we believe in a God who refuses to walk away, who could actually turn inward and ignore us, but instead remains focused outward, focused on relationship with us, then we have to be people who model our behavior on God's behavior. And one of the meanings of the life of Christ is that we don't have to guess what it would look like for God to be one of us. Those of you who know the stories of Jesus know that he was constantly in difficult conversations with people who didn't like him and a lot more who didn't understand him. But people kept following him around and listening to him because he kept speaking in ways they found compelling. He kept telling stories and drawing analogies and giving people chances to see the world in a new way by offering a chance to imagine themselves in new ways. Can you hear the parable of the sower and the seed and not ask, what kind of soil am I? Can you hear the parable of Lazarus and the rich man or the publican and the Pharisee and ask, uh, and not ask, which one am I? Am I really right with God? Do I need to repent? And suddenly people are given a chance to reimagine how they see the world and themselves. It is true that Jesus spoke some harsh, harsh words, but he reserved these for the few and the powerful. And when he spoke them, he did so with a vulnerability that led to his death, not in power that leads to the suppression of others. For most, he offers a sideways invitation to change. Now, you've got other professors here in other departments who can better imagine what kind of persuasion that might be. But for my part, I'll just say that instead of hiding in a safe space where Jesus didn't get questions and didn't have to confront anybody else, Jesus had the courage to persuade, the courage to engage, the courage to speak. And if Jesus had the courage to persuade, we should too. Everyone in this room is wrong about something. Everyone in this room is right about something. And the only way for us to sort that all out is for us to talk to each other about it. What do you think about this? Why? Well, here's what I think about it, and here's why. 
I hear the reason you're giving, but here are a couple of reasons why I don't think that is persuasive. But I will listen while you tell me why you disagree. It's a two-way street. Enduring persuasion from someone who isn't open to persuasion is one of the most miserable experiences a human being can have, and it is not an expression of love. Changing someone's mind takes time. Changing your own mind takes time. And that's okay because when it's real, it takes time. And if you're not convinced, don't change. This is not a matter of wearing Uggs because they're back. This is about doing everything you can to make sure that the world in your head conforms as closely as it can to the one that actually exists. The whole point of a university is that there's a world out there and it actually exists. And through certain methods, we can get to know it better and that that's worth doing. If you love someone, you are serving them by helping them do that same work. Sometimes I hear people use this phrase. I've been known to use it myself. You do you. That is, I don't care what you do. I don't care what you think. Just go do it somewhere else so I don't have to deal with it and I don't have to look at it. But the dark side of you do you is that you might not care whether or not that person rolls over and dies. You do you. What if you do you cuts a person loose to walk down a dark path? You may think you're living your own best life in your preferred reality, but I am not ready to say that the best way of dealing with it when people you love walk down dark roads is to say, you know what? You do you. Live or die, that's up to you. That's not a part of my reality. No. Nope. If I love you, I'm going to try to grab you and I'm gonna try to pull you back from the brink. That's love. The reason Martin Luther King was willing to have all those conversations with these jailers while he was sitting behind bars is because he saw those people as brothers. Not only people who were made in God's image just like he was, but in his case, probably Christians who were in the pew every Sunday morning. And he saw them not as enemies to be defeated, but as brothers who could be brought around who could be friends, who were, after all, living under the same God, in the same world, playing by the same moral rules, but just not understanding how the world and its rules work quite yet. They needed to be taught. They needed to be persuaded. Jesus brought sight to the blind, and our call is to do that for each other, to engage people, to explain yourself, to allow others to explain themselves to you and to listen. To do these things during the age of authenticity, which is an age of rage, takes courage. But I am convinced that it's a courage we are going to have to find to live well in this very strange new world. Thank you all.